as Larry mentioned, you know, I'm in Washington, and uh, uh, one of the things that that has meant uh, somewhat serendipitously for me is that this frontier of traffic between um, sort of my own training and disciplinary background as a sociocultural anthropologist and the ways that uh, cultural, uh, social and cultural knowledge come into specifically policy discussion and practice uh, is, a, is a particular concern of mine. And so I have these different fronts, uh, culture and diplomacy being uh, in one of them, where I pay attention to the ways in which um, culture as a policy concept is leveraged into these discussions and then frames priorities in particular ways. So one of the things we're going to do, I'm going to tell you a few stories today about culture and diplomacy, and we're going to go very, very rapidly through these, and uh, m probably you're, many of you or all of you are somewhat familiar with some or all of these stories, you know, in their general outlines. But what I want to do is just speak to some work that I've done recently having to do, uh, working closely with um, public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy practitioner community. That's the uh, uh, Foreign Service retirees who are in advocacy organizations, active Foreign Service under the public diplomacy cone and in the State Department and elsewhere. And in, in, in some respect to doing, um, uh, subjecting them, and, and they've been quite generous about this, to my own sort of ethnographic sensibilities about the way that they think of the question of culture. And so the idea here in a nutshell is we, being the United States, in, engage in something called diplomacy one significant part of diplomacy as a traditional activity of foreign affairs is uh, so-called public diplomacy, which has become an increasingly capacious space for doing of different kinds of things across different kinds of increasingly sophisticated technological and digital platforms, among other things. So a growing space. And uh, one of the ways in which that has happened is this kind of intersection of culture with diplomacy. So cultural diplomacy as a particular kind of signifying practice in the policy sense. And wanting to clarify with them what they think they mean when they talk about culture in the context of the work that it is supposed to do, or we imagine that it does, in the context of diplomacy. And so that's kind of what this is about. And the stories that I'm going to tell, I think there are three or four that I'll call stories, little narratives. Um, are meant to just draw a, a, a very quick and dirty contrast between, let's call it, the long-term prevailing, uh, largely unexamined assumptions about culture in diplomacy that has more or less uncritically informed our uh, cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy establishment in the United States since World War II. Um, and Another set of emerging kinds of activities that we could also describe as, at least in significant degree, diplomacy, or at least they have sort of diplomatic entailments, which are uh, understood as sometimes very uh, non-traditional forms of uh, public diplomacy or not as diplomacy at all, but which I'm suggesting are actually kind of good emerging models for us to rethink constructively this relationship of culture to, to diplomacy. So it's kind of that contrast that I'm interested in um, uh, plumbing the depths of a little bit here today. So again, it's, it's the problem of uh, policymakers, criti uh, uh, my critique of policymakers' concepts of, of diplomacy. Um, so let's just start here. This is an exciting slide because, oh yeah, can we kill the lights? Thank you. Uh, because an organizational chart, and who, do, who doesn't like organizational slides of organizational charts? Um, there is a cottage industry, at least in Washington, and I want to draw a distinction between sort of discussions that happen inside the Beltway amongst policy decision makers and people who might be engaged, say, in embassies, in, in which, and I like this irony for me, often people call it, you know, being in the field, which is an in interesting turn of phrase. But as, as an anthropologist, we're also in the field often and so on. And in fact, within the cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy community, experience in the field is, in a very similar way, um, kind of one critical professionalizing moment in the advancement in, one, in the profession. You know, quite similar to the way anthropologists talk about it. So there's interesting commonalities. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking mainly about the specific policy ideas, as these are written up in various reports, various recommendations, 
various assessments, various uh, priority statements as issued through the State Department or elsewhere by some um, influential body uh, weighing in on the question of how we should do our public diplomacy, so-called. And what I want to just observe very briefly about that is this has been a, a kind of discussion, uh, a particular kind of discussion, and it's a discussion that we could call sort of musical chairs. And what it's mostly been is um, a long-term concern with the inadequacies of the U.S. public diplomacy um, infrastructure and the organization of the resources that we have as these relate to public diplomacy. And there's a quick backstory to this that you need to know, which is that many of you might need to know that in 1999, um, the Clinton administration closed something called the U.S. Information Agency and then folded what that had been, dispersed it, and folded it into the State Department and uh, USAID and other places. And the U.S. Information Agency had been the primary public diplomacy agency for the U.S. government during uh, the period we talk call the Cold War primarily. And having won the Cold War, we were, meant to, we were led to understand we no longer ne needed such an institutional um, or organization of resources, and so we disbanded it, right? Ever since then, uh, people who are, you know, kind of uh, invested in the professional uh, activities of public diplomacy have talked somewhat nostalgically about the, the old USIA period, comparing it favorably to the present tense. The idea being that the USAIA as an independent, autonomous agency with resources and skilled personnel with experience in the matter of public diplomacy had always done a much more effective, much better job than what we have now, which is a jury-rigged, inadequately resourced and dispersed set of competing, uh, less capable agencies, right? Um, and this is, this is a, a conversation that, that we could fall into the black hole of were we interested to do. So I'm not going to say anything more about that now, but just to let you know that when arguments are offered in Washington about why the United States is so poor at the work of public diplomacy, they often take the form of how can we reorganize existing resources in an institutional way to more effectively leverage them. And what's important about that is, of course, it completely ignores sort of the, the broader encompassing question of what should we be doing and what does it mean to do those things in the, gen in the most general sense? And it's been one of the reasons why there's been actually very little kind of critical self-reflexive discussion in a professional sense about craft, about what it means when culture is put together with diplomacy, for example, right? Those things get less considered in the, you know, trench warfare of budgetary battles and uh, new suggested institutional realignments of resources and so forth and so on. So there's, there's an interesting kind of frame for all of this, which is the lack of uh, inclination to talk about the work of diplomacy as a kind of meaningful practice in its own right. That is taken for granted. It is unexamined. Instead, what is discussed is how can we better organize resources to achieve that which we take for granted. So in part what I want to do is not take that for granted and step back and in the conversations and work I've done with these public diplomacy folks, so see what they think they're doing, right? The fact that they choose to want to have these kinds of conversations suggests that they don't often do that, right? Now, of course, um, this should be, this is a World War II era type U.S. Uh, propaganda poster. I use the word purposefully. It's not what we would call diplomacy in any reasonable sense, but it, there were many of these kinds of things. Going forward after World War II and over the course of the, of the middle of the 20th century, however, we know that broadly speaking, in the broadest sense, Public diplomacy has been an activity that imagines its work as a set of things we're engaged in doing with others for the purpose of conveying certain key goals and aims and concepts, like what does democracy mean, right? So many of you are probably aware of, you know, kind of the contentiousness that exists around notions like American-style democracy. 
its application to the rest of the world, how democracy assistance programs work in the United States, how they can sometimes be troublesome. You might recall uh, some of the controversy around the, uh, after the Mubarak administration was overthrown in Egypt with uh, National Endowment for Democracy and other organiza U.S. organizations, U.S. government funded organizations in Egypt and that became at that point of, of volatile transition a sticking point for the Egyptian government in, in, in particular ways. And this isn't that unusual. Um, but I merely want to point out that one of the things we take for granted is the idea that embedded in the work of cultural diplomacy, or culture as a kind of vehicle, the idea is that it is diplomacy because it is conveying certain kinds of key, critical, kind of American political concepts, right? Um, we, could, we could talk uh, a little bit later if you're interested about sort of how some of these concepts have variably polyphonic lives, like the word democracy, right? a loaded term meaning many things if ever there was one. I'm sorry it's such a bad um, uh, reproduction. And when Ciudadano, the good citizen, you can see here, uh, what does it say? Como un ciudadano tienes ciertas responsabilidades en una democracia, right? This is um, a pamphlet type comic book of the sort routinely produced by the U.S. Information Agency during the Cold War. Um, and I just wanted to briefly, this is by way of a thumbnail sketch of the history of diplomacy in the, in the, over the course of the 20th century. World War II, now the Cold War. Um, where what, one of the things that the USIA did was produce these cultural artifacts like comic books and distributed them around regions like Latin America to, for example, teach the practices of democracy like voting. Right, the disciplinary behavior, the disciplined behavior of the need to responsibly enact your rights and obligations as a citizen to, to vote. Right, so this is kind of a pedagogical, cultural tool. You, the only reason I've included it is in addition to sort of generating, demonstrating the sort of thing that USIA was in, involved in. You see a little bit more subtle and now much more into the institutional thick of things rather than we're bringing a heap of democracy whoop ass uh, during World War II. Uh, here, you notice on the bottom, this was uh, drawn by Jim Henson, aka the Muppet Master. So one of the things that Jim Henson did during the 60s uh, was work very closely with the U.S. Information Agency and generated a lot of uh, pamphlet-type information of this sort. And the Muppets had as, a, as their origin um, a kind of USAIA-style cultural diplomacy approach to, um, to these kinds of questions. They were invented and enlisted in the project of engaging with foreign publics. Now, of course, Cold War is over. Um, you know, uh, it's been over for some time. We pr provisionally live in some kind of era. We, we typically describe using words like globalization and so forth. We don't entirely quite know what we mean by those words when we use them, but we do, mean, we do know what we mean it has something to do with, you know, the ways things are much more interconnected than they were before and that um, if we're going to do the work of public diplomacy, it's much more now than previously about coming to terms with global cultural flows. If any of you have read any of the work of people like Arjuna Potterai, folks of, of that ilk, who are giving us a vision of the way that culture moves through a globalizing world and so forth, this image kind of nicely captures that. Um, you'll notice there's a whole set of different kinds of things that are supposed to be connected in this cacophony of cultural coming together, um, some of which might or might not fit well. So on the far corner, you'll notice that there seems to be an iconography of a, of a fast food variety. And then on the bottom there, there's the Mona Lisa and so on. Um, I think many of us would consider these very distinct kinds of things. Uh, here, the suggestion is they're all part of the, the grand uh, movement of uh, largely American cultural stuff. So ground zero, the present tense of the work that public diplomacy practitioners do today, they imagine happens against the backdrop of a globalizing world within which specifically American culture has not just hegemonic uh, standing but is uh, 
astronomically more present in in sense of uh, available volume of it and variety of it than any other kind of competing national cultural uh, industry, let's say, right? And so this is the, the immediate backdrop against which that work is being done now. So it kind of everything that I say here hereafter supposes that public diplomacy practitioners thinking are thinking in this way. Um, and I just wanted to briefly suggest before we move out into that first story that I want to tell about kind of the globalization era cultural politics of diplomacy, that there's a lot involved potentially that could be described as cultural diplomacy of one sort or another. Um, suggested here by, by this uh, uh, blog tag scattergram or whatever we call it. Is there a technical word for these things? There probably is. Um, I was kind of hoping someone would know. Everyone was like, I don't know. <laughs> a wordle. Thank you for that. I, you know what? I'm loving that term, and I'm, I'm going to make it my own from now on, because who, who wouldn't like wordle? It sounds Zeusian. Um, so I just wanted to quickly draw your attention, moving out from this. When we talk about cultural diplomacy policy and practice, and the community of professional folks, not just in government, but significantly so, and outside of government, engaged in this work, we're talking about people who have, on the one hand, typically a very clear sense of mission and a very clear sense of what they are doing. At the same time, I want to suggest to you that that clear sense of mission should be contrasted with the fact that, in practice, what they are doing actually involves uh, an incredible array of different kinds of stuff. And so there's a tension between the relative clarity of here's what we're doing, here's our goals, here's the expected outcomes we have, and here's what we could mean by this, and here's what could be done, and here's what's involved. So there's a tremendous variety of different kinds of things going on, all of which is, it can be subsumed very loosely under the so rubric of cultural diplomacy. right? Um, and that is significant, actually, because one of the issues fundamental to this discussion is the extent to which people mean the same things when they talk about this, <laughs> the same terms. And that might sound trivial, but it's not. Um, so if you're talking about uh, public diplomacy practitioners who are using terms, but using them very differently, with very different genealogies, with very different content, with very different implications of, for efficacy, what it can reasonably accomplish as work, what problems it might uh, reasonably be expected to solve. This can be very troublesome, since at a very basic level, we're after all talking about acts of communica communication across international divides. Right? So we're talking about a context that is already shot through with and charged with the requirements of clarity and translation, the challenge of translation. And then we're doing things which can take many different forms and which we might be imagining in many different ways, but which we might be describing the same way, as if there's consensus about this, when in fact there isn't. And if there isn't, that might be a very poor basis for, let's call it, charitably, diplomacy. So I'll, I'll come back to that point. So uh, one of the stories that I want to tell very, very rapidly is one you're probably already familiar with which is the story of soft power. Right? So the term soft power, which entered our lexicon only fairly recently, circa 1990, Joe Nye, the Kennedy School, Harvard, et cetera, um, has written and popularized this term as a policy term of choice for some time. And uh, in many ways, when we talk about cultural diplomacy today with cultural diplomacy professionals, they assume that we're talking about soft power, or some version of soft power folded into some other scheme of smart power or something like this, but uh, soft power being the key. So I just want to make, um, to start as a first story, a couple of quick points about soft power. We're not going to offer an incisive nuanced critique. We're at best going to kind of caricature the soft power discussion here really quickly so that we can contrast it with other things. The first thing to notice is that Nye made an argument about soft power as significantly based on 
the U.S. advantages in the area of popular, global popular culture and wanted to say that we are, uh, you know, Hollywood, et cetera, et cetera, so dominant in these, in these areas that these should be useful for us in the business of persuading others to, and this is his felicitous or unfelicitous phrase, depending on where you stand on the soft power thing, want what we want, right? Why use hard power, right? when you can use soft power and simply persuade people to want what you want, to think like you think, to be like you are. Right? And for him, the key to this was uh, U.S. popular culture. So represented here in some of its better known variegated uh, diversity. And this is exactly the kind of content in its kind of logoized format uh, that we imagine is in the era of globalization um, composing these global cultural flows, at least as emanating from the United States, right? Uh, often taking, for example, the form of goods and services, culture in the form of goods and services. And one of the keys about soft power is that you should be able to measure it. Uh, Betty and I were just talking about metrics and, and the happy subject of uh, measuring cultural impacts and the impacts of the arts. And um, one of the things that people want to do with soft power is measure things like level of influence. Um, and I want to just draw your attention to the language that is associated with, as you can see here, the U.S. is considered the most influential soft power uh, purveyor, with China a rising second and so forth, uh, as evaluated by, by these countries themselves. Um, I actually don't care at all about who ranks where on the whole soft power index or scale, but I think it's kind of interesting that we would want to have this scale and that we would want to talk about influence because it makes explicit what should be fairly explicit if it wasn't already, uh, what the politics of the concept of soft power are about. This is uh, Tara Sunshine. She's the current undersecretary for public diplomacy in State Department, which is the cone under which all of this work is done. And she's talking at, rec at a recent conference uh, put on by, uh, by a, a German organization called the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, it's a German-American organization based in Berlin. And you see behind her the slide for her talk, leveraging culture, leveraging culture and diplomacy in the age of information. So there's kind of two things going on here. A, we're leveraging stuff and that's the soft power language. B, we're always doing it in the sort of proliferating new formats of the present future. You know, the kinds of happenings that we associate with uh, new social media and its rapid invention and reinvention and so on. But that just is, is more uh, grist for the mill, as it were, right? More um, footprint that we can use to accomplish the goals of leveraging, right? So one of the stories, in other words, is the soft power story. And within that story is an implicit set of ideas about culture, right, which goes something like that, right? Now, there is, again, as with uh, uh, the discussion about institutional uh, change vis-a-vis uh, -vis public diplomacy in federal government, a large body of literature and discussion around the concept of soft power, and we're not really even engaging with that literature in any meaningful way here, but just simply to remind you that with this soft power concept, a series of things are put together in one place as co-varying. One of them is the particular role for popular culture, for a particularly U.S. popular culture. The other is its efficacious global circulation. The other is the language of leveraging of influence and of the uh, achievement of national interests, uh, right? Influence and interests. And the ways in which this is one of the newer forms to uh, use the old USIA language that the United States is telling its story to the world just now, right? Um, and it's a form where values, and I want to remind you of that propaganda slide about democracy, big bag of democracy. The, the game afoot is that in the expressive forms and artifacts and goods and services uh, and performances of culture are found these values and that these values are readily communicable, readily available for communication and that the effectiveness of these kinds of cultural diplomatic intervention 
relies precisely on this conviction, precisely on this idea that these values are straightforwardly extractable, right? Um, this is a critical, let's call it, ideological underpinning of the model of diplomacy where culture and diplomacy are, are brought together in some uh, way, shape, or form within this professional community, right? The, the efficacy of it relies upon its, the way it's, it's a good medium, right, to convey these, these critical values to the world. And, and I'm going to kind of get carried away with that theme here in a little bit. So here's another story I want to tell you. So that was the uh, soft power story. Here's the jazz ambassador story, which many of you know probably. Has anyone ever heard of this, who, the jazz ambassadors? Yeah. So arguably the most successful cultural diplomacy program that the USIA instituted in the 20th century was the so-called Jazz Ambassadors Program. This meant that, amongst other things, uh, U.S. Uh, musicians, mostly African American, though not exclusively, some of the most famous Jazz Ambassadors were, were not African American, Dave Brubeck and company, uh, regularly went around the world um, in, in kind of strategic ways uh, following the Cold War maps of the of uh, the way the world was then divided up, um, playing their, their jazz, right? And uh, jazz had a particular role um, in the sort of cultural diplomacy toolkit of the times. Um, it was a specifically originally American musical form, and at least when jazz was still massively popular and played you know, regularly on the radio waves, um, it was considered the prime example of, right, sort of new American music, originally American music. We might argue that there's others, blues comes to mind. But jazz was uh, prioritized, right, and presented and compartmentalized as specifically American. And it was also, of course, talked about in the USIA mode as, you know, the music of freedom. Does anyone, is, are there musicians among us? Um, so, what do we know about jazz that might identify it in that way? What is specific to jazz? Of course, if, if, you're, if you know anything about jazz, you know already, you're like, what is he talking about jazz? There's not jazz, there's just all these different kinds of ways of playing music that sometimes we call jazz. But uh, setting that problem aside of the, of the music sort, uh, what is it about jazz that might make it of interest to cultural diplomacy practitioners? and make it the basis of this incredibly successful program. Any, any quick ideas? Yeah. Well, basically, I mean, jazz, you're not necessarily following actual music that you're, that you're playing. You're kind yeah. of, everyone sets, you set the key signature that everyone kind right. of improvises and does their own thing. So it represents democracy in that way. Yeah, thank you for that brief and quick summary of the next 10 minutes of my talk. I really appreciate <laughs> that. No, no. Uh, that's, uh, that's precisely it. In other words, what I want to draw your attention to is the representational politics at work here with uh, kind of the, the mode of classic cultural diplomacy in the, in the, in the example of the, of the jazz ambassadors. So you've got Louis Armstrong, you've got Brubeck, you've got all these jazz luminaries. So here's Louis Armstrong. This is a, an interesting book about the uh, spectacular success of this program, which um, was ongoing and in a way one might say continues to be ongoing um, for decades and decades. Uh, and here's a, a Dave Brubeck quote about, now Dave Brubeck and, uh, you guys know like Take Five, you know, uh, that, and his uh, quartet were, were extremely prolific jazz ambassadors, made many, many trips overseas, often went to Europe and, and, and focused on Eastern Europe in particular in the 50s and 60s. He just passed away, I think, last year, 90-something. Um, and this is a comment of his that I want to draw your attention to because it illustrates what people think practitioners, jazz ambassadors, think happens. The particular alchemy that takes place in the context of moments, effective moments, efficacious moments of, of cultural diplomacy. And you'll notice something fascinating. What we have in common as artists and human beings, right? dropping the current media narratives and so on and so forth, there's a way in which the claim here is in fact actually very sort of hostile to the idea of culture at all. In other words, the purpose of culture is to allow us effectively to transcend culture so that we can get to 
the basis of our common and shared humanity, right, which is something that we can express as a shared love of music, right, uh, the shared musicality that all of us as humans uh, simply have, simply basically have, right? And that, you know, shared humanity, right, is often um, the way in which we describe the efficacy of specifically arts diplomacy within the broader rubric of cultural diplomacy, right? It's just a self-evident, transcendent way of getting to the bottom line about us as people, right? Cutting through all the political um, disagreements and distrust and desconfianza and everything else to, to that bottom line so that we can just understand that we all have this in common, right? <clears throat> this notion of how cultural diplomacy leads to shared commonalities crossing otherwise fra excuse me, fraught geopolitical frontiers is precisely one of those ideas that I think we need to take a much harder look at, in part because it doesn't make any sense, but uh, coming back to that, um, that's in part one of the notions about the jazz ambassadors. So as, as you were saying and, and as we've been talking about, there, there's a reason why jazz, right, because jazz fits so well with critical American values, the values of virtuosic individualism and freedom of expression, um, not having to play within the tight confines of classical musical theory and such. Uh, and I, I want you to notice the fact of, of, of the politics of the Cold War politics of the day, um, the role of, of African American musicians in a context prior to civil rights where you had African American musicians often going abroad and speaking frankly about their experience as African Americans in the United States in a way that for the architects of the program simply reinforced the fact of free expression that so marks us as a society. Kind of ironic, right? They can only speak freely, apparently, outside the U.S., not, not inside. Um, so again, I'm drawing your attention to a, cult a set of relationships between the role of cultural expression in the context of diplomacy and the way that, expre that expression is understood to be communicative of political and other values that form the basis for what we are doing together as diplomacy. Now. Um, so if the jazz ambassadors aren't, aren't quite what they were, we still do something very much like it today. Hip hop diplomacy and so on is an incredibly popular thing in the State Department. Uh, these are, does anyone know the diplomats? All right. Uh, they, they've done some of these junkets. Here's, um, I think this is a US ambassador in Dakar. Uh, he's he's um, inaugurating a hip hop academy spelled with a K. Uh, and uh, we do this kind of thing all the time. And the idea, just very quickly, is of course that hip-hop diplomacy is modern jazz diplomacy. And I, I'm just reminding you of this to suggest that our ideas about this whole process haven't changed a whole lot over time. Right? They've been very persistent. Um, and part of how they work is, as I've been saying, by presenting a particular kind of representational politics. And it's a representational politics we imagine now in the post 9-11 era designed to meet specific challenges in this kind of a way. This is a, an exhibition of uh, abstract expressionist. I think you can probably figure out Warhol has something to do with it. Art, American art in Dubai uh, a couple of years ago. All right? And what I'm wanting to draw your attention to is the spectacular nature of these efforts, their visual characteristics. This includes the performative possibilities of musicians, right, who don't just play music, right, but they put on shows. And putting on the show is part of, you know, uh, the, the visual performative dimension of, of, this, of this kind of work. And, and within those shows is thought to, to uh, reside much of, the, much of the power of these efforts. So just to bring, this last conversational turn to its conclusion, I'm suggesting that we have written into our practice a kind of attitude and ideology about representational practice as, uh, in a very kind of Richard Rortian sense, overtly favoring the visual, 
uh, mirroring uh, powerfully um, our self-identity in a way uh, conveyed through culture, understood in its instrumental problem-solving mode, essentially as a vehicle, right? An unproblematic, politically uncontroversial vehicle of communication of these, of these critical ideas that we want to convey to the rest of the world. Richard Arndt wrote a, a longtime USAA uh, Foreign Service officer and uh, who wrote a very, let's call it, magisterial book called The First Resort of Kings. I say magisterial because gigantic. Um, sort of encyclopedically uh, recounting his days in, in the USIA. And he has this nice quote about the daily, the daily work on the job was about promoting the sights and sounds of democracy, the sights and sounds, right? This makes it very kind of clear where the, where the burden of um, energy uh, lies there. And interestingly, and, and there's a longer discussion we could have about this kind of thing, which we don't really have time for, I don't think, but the way in which these specifically cultural ambassadors, and there's other stories about cultural ambassadors that, that are interesting to tell, like the um, sort of Japanese-inspired human treasures uh, program of, at UNESCO and other places, where specific individuals are designated as critically important cultural practitioners, and they're sort of like living artifacts. And if, and if you're a person who is designated thusly, it's really not a good deal at all because suddenly overnight you've gone from being a guy who makes pots to a guy who can never leave his country of origin because uh, his pots represent, you know, the critical cultural uh, expression of uh, country X. And if he were to die, you know, we'd lose the whole kit and caboodle, you know, so he's, you know, a kind of living scarce commodity overnight because he represents in himself as, a, as an individual, you know, all of the representational burden of the whole. And that is to say, of course, that one of the things going on here is that as we move hither and yon across these boundaries, there's not a lot of discussion about or, or thinking about the internal uh, variegated diversity of what we might be thinking about as different cultures that are, that are colliding or being put into communication through the work of diplomacy, right? So the idea is there's something called American culture. We export it in massive and constant ways. Uh, the rest of the world receives it. And American culture is American culture, and it's recognizably such. And then there's German culture, and um, you know, then there's Dutch culture, and somehow tulips and clogs are probably involved in some way, but we don't know how. And all of these cultures are coherent and fairly unitary, and our relationship to them are shared meaningfully in a kind of even-handed way, distributed across the society of which we're a part. Um, and so there's not really any building into this work the possibility that people might variably interpret to this content, right? Um, so, that, so ambassadors can fully represent because they're not understood as sort of talking from some particular subject position somewhere in an otherwise contentious space of ideas about X, right? They're just unproblematically representing. But as we know, particularly in the era of cultural globalization, there are some controversies. I'm not going to plumb the depths of those, but just to remind you that the uh, global circulation of American popular culture is not met with universal positive appraisal and uh, is sometimes seen as deeply problematic. McDonaldization, coca colonization, uh, Disneyfication, and all these other lovely neoliberalisms, uh, neo I was going to say, but I meant neologisms. Uh, probably not accidental. Uh, and uh, one of, of course, the, the major concerns that a lot of uh, other countries tend to bring to bear in multilateral contexts of discussion like uh, UNESCO and elsewhere is this idea that you know, the American popular culture is so overwhelmingly present that it's actually kind of a threat to the cultural integrity of other uh, cultural identities, and that this is an ongoing serious crisis. Um, we've been particularly, and I, I, I suppose understandably, um, uh, we've, we've not been terribly plugged into this discussion within the culture and policy space in Washington and in the United States, um, where there's, there's not a lot of critical discussion about the ways in which cult, specifically cultural globalization might be problematic. Um, 
So uh, one of the things I'm just registering very quickly is not, and not really making any argument about it in particular, is that there are plenty of arguments about this and, and plenty of conflict and diversity around the, the sort of soft power understanding of U.S. popular culture as a kind of critical export for the work of cultural diplomacy. But of course now we live in an era where other countries are um, increasingly generating their soft power potential. And we often talk about things like Confucius Institutes and, and Chinese soft power. And here's a sort of soft power type representation of China's uh, recent Olympics. Uh, and you see what's interesting about it is the extent to which it's sort of adopted all of the features of kind of US style soft power presentation. We got like Coke bottle like looking stuff and you know a uh, logoized pre self -present presentation of self and so forth and so on. Um, so of course now we're also living in a world of competing soft power kind of zero sum uh, politics. Right? Um, now all of this is part of different parts of arguments that I've been making in different ways in different places about the kind of wholesale inadequacies of all of this work for what ostensibly we would take to be at least one of the primary purposes of any kind of diplomatic <coughs> intervention, which is meaningful conversation, dialogue. So here I'm, I'm, I'm using dialogue more or less in a generic sense and not in a specifically linguistic sense, but I'm uh, engaged in a kind of linguist's light critique of the, uh, the lack of attention to a, a more thoroughly dialogic kind of cultural diplomatic engagement. And where I'm going to end up, and hopefully we'll have some time to talk a little bit about it, uh, is by giving quickly some examples of things that seem to be happening that have more promise in this regard. Uh, right? But um, our kind of representational politics, the picture of the world approach that I had been talking about earlier, combined with the sort of one-sidedness of the role of the effort of leveraging and uh, influencing to promote interests, um, shape the narrative, control the message. These are all sort of stock boilerplate terms that you find in many, many kinds of State Department type memos about reorganizing its public diplomacy capacities and so on. And I'm suggesting that uh, it's problematic to talk about uh, shaping the narrative because people understand that there's a kind of command and control function at work. And when they understand that, of course, what that means is it loses credibility, right, in a very basic kind of a way. And what that has meant is over time, certain kind of critical features of the broader engagement that is uh, public diplomacy have not been given a terrible amount of attention. Like, systematically how do you build in capacities for things like listening right, rather than simply message delivery. Right? So there's two parts to that. One is the, the relatively simplistic notion of message delivery that seems to be built into the policy thinking about this effort. Sort of you've got a message, you've got a sender, you've got a receiver. It's the old football. Here it comes. You better catch it. Um, <coughs> and the fact that, that apparently no one's going to be throwing a football, or excuse me, soccer ball, uh, back in our direction, right? And uh, how that's going to work. So one of the problems that I've been moving toward emphasizing, underlining, uh, is this, this critical lack of attention to things like more thoroughly dialogic listening as built into any kind of collaboration we might label as diplomacy of one sort or another. Uh, so here's a couple of things that seem to be kind of different from that. And I'm just going to go through them very quickly and then maybe we can have a little discussion. Um, so this is uh, uh, OECD, is the Organization of Economic, for Economic Cooperation, which is a kind of a uh, several decades old a global development, multilateral organization. Um, and as you can tell by the discussions there, talks about a lot of really tedious technocratic stuff and so on. but what this represents is just a little corner of the broader universe of let's call it international scientific cooperation, right? And international scientific cooperation is, is a happening thing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's happening in all kinds of ways. It's not just CERN. Uh, but why I'd like to throw that out here is a little bit different is because if we were to think about this for a while, it represents a somewhat different model than what I'd been talking about previously. For one thing, 
we're starting with interactants to the, uh, to the engagement who typically already assume things like the value of science. Like they might not have different ideas about where science sits, let's say, in a national policy space, but we're not having to make the case that science is the thing we should all be talking about, which is not the case with, say, democracy. Right? Democracy is problematic as an export. Science, not so much. Right? The debates around science, um, particularly U.S. science, is why won't you let it move more freely around the world? Right? Which is sort of the inverse of the cultural global flows debate, which is why do you keep letting all these Coke bottles rain down upon us and so forth and so on. Right? So one area of possible interest is international scientific cooperation, uh, which I'm, you notice I'm not saying science diplomacy. And the reason is because it doesn't start as diplomacy. It starts as some problems that we need to address together, like this nanotech thing. What are we going to do? There's some issues. So we need some multilateral regulation. Right? So people who know what is happening in this field have to develop comprehensive shared policies around that. And to do so, they have to engage the technology and discourse of science in nanotech to get it done. Now, we can critique that discourse, but that's a discourse that starts as shared in this encounter. Right? Uh, another interesting development, and we were just talking about uh, uh, incubators. Uh, this is a kind of online incubator. Uh, GitHub, is anyone familiar with GitHub? It's the largest open source uh, code um, site in the world. And it's kind of, you know, part of, uh, if any of you guys follow people like Chris Anderson, Wired, and what have you, um, he talks about, he's in love with something he calls the maker movement, which is just a kind of updated, build things in your garage, can do notion for the, you know, digital age. Um, and there's some interesting things in there, uh, if unrealistic in many ways. But the idea that open source platforms and our arguments about what is open source and how should it be open source, this is another kind of interesting emerging frontier, right? Um, people are passionate about how open source should work, about how information should be available, and about how it forms the basis for innovation collaboration, right? So here, unlike international scientific cooperation, it's more uh, tech startup engineering and innovation, right? Through these kinds of particular online collaborations of uh, information sharing, right? Similar, similar sort of spirit. Completely different kind of thing, but I want to suggest not all that different in sort of philosophical starting point are things like uh, theater without borders, right? Modeled obviously on things like doctors without borders. Um, which engages in all kinds of um, artistic uh, bridge building activities uh, like this one. They collaborate with this very interesting program at Brandeis uh, which does this kind of peace building for the arts uh, work. Now you see the little blurb there. Yes. Uh, what's interesting about this is, and now I want to be clear how I'm using this here. I'm not necessarily saying that this is an excellent model, but I want to, because I think there are probably some, some things we can talk about when we talk about the way the arts are employed in conflict resolution, peace building, um, intercultural communication, and other kinds of typical touchstones of that sort in the broader humanitarian space. Um, but what we're seeing is a kind of applied arts, right? It's not art for art's sake. It's Okay, art has to have a social purpose. And what is that social purpose? Well, to get work done. We might say, what? Well, maybe not. I don't know about that. But even so, the kind of work it should get done is, in this particular case, specifically humanitarian. Right? And so what I want to draw your attention to there is, so humanitarian uh, crises, humanitarian disasters, these are things that happen. They're not planned. Right? But then once they happen, Right? There are things that happen in their wake as a response. Right? So it's sort of the opposite to the way in which we imagine soft power is effective. You don't create a program and apply the hammer. What you do is 
you respond to situations of need where your response is welcome. And you create collaborative opportunity in meeting other people's requirements in often desperate circumstances. Right? A very different kind of geopolitical way into a relationship. Um, so, so these kinds of programs are stepping into those kinds of crisis situations and engaging in various collaborative um, um, efforts. What's interesting is it's not just going and playing, right, jazz ambassadors. It's going and establishing relationships. There's pedagogy, there's training, um, so there's skills transfer. So in this case, we're talking about things like, how do you do choreography? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's work on that. So choreography is a specific skill that's at issue here that people are learning as part of their, their arts-based project, right? I'm obviously painting this in an extremely idealized way, uh, but I'm doing so because I'm wanting to make that polemical point about the ways in which certain kinds of arts practitioners are increasingly becoming players, agents, along frontiers of relationships, let's call them networks, through which certain kinds of information, value, are, are moving. Right? And it's a kind of model of cultural diplomacy that we're, we're not quite clear about yet. In other words, it's not a prevailing model. It doesn't have pride of place in our understanding of how cultural diplomatic work gets done because it's not primarily, firstly, only about diplomacy. It's about other things, and then also diplomacy might be a part of it. Um, I think you saw this guy uh, last week. Uh, if you were there, second from the right, I guess, is Bill Ivey. This is, um, looks like a good meal, but this is a meeting of the China-U.S. Forum on Cultural Sustainability. I don't think he talked about that. Did Bill talk about that at all when he was here? So uh, Bill used to be at the Curb Center at Vanderbilt University, and Vanderbilt University has a relationship with Chinese counterparts to work on, and also participating is the uh, American Folklore Society and their Chinese counterpart folklore societies, to work on shared understandings of the role of culture and heritage, or cultural heritage, in um, professional folklore studies in China. Right? So what's interesting about this is that they have these meetings as colleagues who already begin the meeting right, as people who are you know, kind of vocationally committed to the work of folklore, heritage, this kind of stuff. And then really it's about understanding the differences and uh, uh, shared commitments that these two different national professional communities have so that they can be clear going forward in work that they want to do together. Uh, partly what this work is about is providing um, a professionalizing oomph to um, nascent, um, the nascent development of Chinese uh, heritage and, and folklore studies, the professionalization of that work. Right? So learning from colleagues in the U.S. and elsewhere, but also dealing with critical differences about, say, what cultural heritage means nationally in these, in these various countries. Right? Um, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, digital libraries. I'm just going to talk about one real quickly. Europeana, which is a huge, colossal program, uh, a project of the uh, EU that uh, involves, I think at this point, over 2,000 institutions, which have all made their various digitized collections available in one uh, comprehensive portal. Um, but what's more interesting about this is that it's not just a static collection for viewing. And this is kind of where things seem to be headed in the, in the digital humanities. It's um, also a tremendous opportunity for participatory curation. So what happens is people develop um, interesting communities within the broader di context of, of the digital context of, of Europeana, um, exploring collections in ways they haven't been explored before, creating new collections by putting together different things that people hadn't really thought about, or at least professional curators hadn't really thought about as maybe relevant. And insofar as they do that, exploring European history 
in ways at a moment where the EU is going kind of through a little bit of a crisis, folks, uh, providing a way to talk about Europeanness, right, in, in kind of fundamentally collaborative, sometimes even innovative ways through these kinds of participatory curation uh, possibilities, right? So it's not just a collaboration among cultural institutions who have made their digital collections available so that people who can't visit them in person can view them. It's furthermore a fundamentally collaborative, creative, new, emergent engagement with kind of a critical cultural question, right? What is Europeanness? And going forward, how can we, you know, you know, continue to use that pronoun in constructive ways? We. Uh, all right, so you, Richard Curran is going to come in a few weeks, I think. Um, he's uh, uh, heads the uh, directs the Art, History, and Culture Program for the Smithsonian. And I'm sure he's going to talk about the Haiti, Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, so I'm not going to go into too much depth about that, but I am going to just briefly reference it. So this is a picture of the immediate aftermath of the 2010 Haitian earthquake. Um, you see here that one of the critical dimensions of that disaster was that many of the cultural, architectural features of the landscape were either totally destroyed or extremely badly damaged. So one of the things that Curran and company did, uh, the Smithsonian, um, collaborated with different other uh, actors and, and Haitian um, authority, cultural authorities, to save and uh, to uh, restore much of this much of uh, Haiti's um, imperiled um, cultural legacy. And what's interesting about this, and so here's a, uh, someone restoring a wall mural um, in, I forget the name of this building is, but it's a very famous building that it sort of a mural by a famous Haitian um, muralist who had paint, painted very con um, controversial political history of, of, of Haiti's post-colonial period. And so it's kind of a critical piece of Haitian public discourse and identity, right, as a, as a nation. And one of the things I want to emphasize about the, uh, you'll hear more about that if you're here for Richard's thing, but about the Haitian Cultural Recovery Project is, again, what we're talking about are relationships built up often amongst professionals in the cultural field where certain kinds of skill sets like conser conservation, so cultural conservation, conservators, curation, um, architecture, all kinds of other things are mobilized collaboratively with Haitian counterparts. But where the critical direction of this mobilization is entirely um, under Haitian control. So it was Haitian counterparts deciding, you know, kind of where the needs priorities were. It was um, Haitian counterparts deciding what needed to be saved, uh, and it was Haitian counterparts deciding what to do with it, amongst other things. And like some of the other quick examples I've been giving you here of these sort of alternative emergent interventions, um, the critical piece here is it's a kind of humanitarian intervention. It's happening in the context of disaster where um, the critical mass of response in Haiti wasn't um, up to the task of dealing with the, 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 you know, scale of this disaster. It was an opportunity for collaboration. Haitians reached out to the Smithsonian. They moved forward with a project um, to promote Haiti's own conversation about its own historical cultural memory, right, and the need to uh, preserve that, keep it intact, and, and allow the possibility for Haitians to continue to have this conversation about their, their cultural identity as a people going forward. A very different idea. So a couple of things I just want to draw this to a, a rapid conclusion. One is I've been suggesting that when we talk about kind of professional discussions of cultural diplomacy, we tend to think about the key actors either as nation states or as civil society in some amorphous way. I've been um, giving more attention to these critical um, heritage or uh, uh, applied uh, humanities networks. I'm suggesting that these networks have certain advantages 
um, to as up, up against the kind of prevailing um, ideas about the efficacy of culture in the work of diplomacy. Um, they enact a kind of inversion of the prevailing cultural politics, the representational politics of the kinds of diplomacy that tends to be done primarily by government, although notice the Smithsonian is, of course, part of the U.S. government in a way. Yeah, it's funded in significant degree by the government. Um, and that the critical thing here is to transform the goals, the means ends, from beginning with a concept to convey to ending with an emergent concept that we share in common. That's the critical thing. Because of the different uh, implications there for power, for the possibility of collaboration, for the ways of creating sharedness. Sharedness not as assumed at the outset or as, uh, as uh, imposed, but as emergent in projects we undertake together for reasons specifically about things we, we are trying to do, which might or might not have anything firstly to do with diplomacy, typically have a humanitarian dimension, and are enabling possibilities for, for relation building. Um, so I'm suggesting that we would be well served to pay more attention to these phenomena, to um, the ways these networks happen, to what flows amongst these networks, to the variable ways that information is understood globally, locally, right? to the ways shared frames are created. In this case, I've been dwelling on some examples here toward the end, all of which share the fact of being invested in different interventions around the concept of heritage. Right? And so the thing is that heritage has become a prevailing critical policy concept. Um, it's been around but it's received tremendous lift over the last 15 years or so. And a lot of interesting work is being organized underneath this umbrella. But at the same time, the concept itself is being made and remade in these, in these conversations. So what happens? Well, we emergently share this com commitment to this concept of heritage, even if we might be understanding it in a variety of different ways as interactants in that shared conversation. Right? And for me, anyway, the, the key here is kind of redirecting the prevailing professional kind of normative, largely unexamined ideas about culture and diplomacy away from the sort of message delivery, representational politics of display toward something where what we're trying to do is write each other more thoroughly into each other's stories in different ways, telling those stories together, as it were. And I'll stop there. So thank you. We have time for about 15 minutes of questions. Anybody have a question? talk a little bit more about the ways that um, economic relations fit into what you've been discussing. Because um, uh, when, if you take into consideration the fact that the State Department is, is theoretically representing both the, the political and economic interests of the U.S. abroad, how they might be entangled um, on one hand, and on the other, the things that you mentioned at the end, dance and theater, and even to an extent, pure scientific research, that even though these are things that require a certain amount of funding, mm -hmm. they're not activities that typically move or involve the transfer of large amounts of, of capital right, across borders. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe expand upon uh, how what you were talking about. This so I, I, I'm not, I'm not um, I think, altogether convinced that we're not actually talking about large amounts of capital moving across borders. I think that certainly with um, some of the arguments about cultural goods and services, we're talking about very large economic questions. So tourism is a large economic sector in the trillions of dollars globally, right? Um, part of the, so I'll give you one quick example about, say, how some of these um, interactions are shaped by essentially economic priorities that then in turn lead to sort of challenging diplomatic impasses. 
So you, you might be aware that, that, that the U.S. had been out of UNESCO for many years, and uh, mostly because it was tired of, of funding things an organization it felt wasn't beneficial to its broader foreign policy goals. But it got back in circa 2003, largely because there was a flurry of, of activity kind of um, uh, around new cultural conventions in UNESCO that were going to be problematic for kind of American interests in the area of cultural goods and services, Hollywood, Nashville, you know, uh, music, movies, and so on. And the long story short is that there was just a fundamental disagreement between American negotiators to these conventions and their, and their counterparts, people who were seeing things very differently. And I'm not talking about sub-Saharan Africa. I'm talking about France, Canada, <laughs> countries with whom we often have amicable, agree ag agreeable relations. Canadians were seeing this very, very differently from the U.S. Uh, and, and the difference can be boiled down to a tendency for the U.S. to see the flow of cultural goods and services in economic terms as about freedom of expression and choice, think consumer choice, as opposed to um, a lot of these other countries who saw critical culture industries like film as kind of bulwarks to national identity, as vehicles of identity. So we need to uh, defend the French film industry from the fact that, you know, the newest Sylvester Stallone feature is in nine out of every ten theaters on the basis that it's undermining French you know, uh, civilization, right? Um, but from the American side, it was entirely about money. You know, this is a huge global economic uh, juggernaut, and, you know, we need to keep it unregulated, WTO style, right? So that's to say that um, these economic factors often shape the way in which we understand the content of culture as valuable in debates about culture and diplomacy. I'm not sure if this answers your concern, though. Well, I guess I, I, I think that, in a certain way, was my point, if I didn't articulate it clearly, because you have that on one hand, yeah. right? And on the other hand, you have these things like you're talking about folklore sure. groups and digital humanities things or whatever. And you're saying um, these are sort and, of small uh, scale. And I'm saying you know, the fact that uh, the government <coughs> doesn't necessarily coordinate or contemplate these other sorts of activities yeah. that might promote a more just world with less violence and more understanding, et cetera, et cetera, these sort of utopian goals sure. that, that they are left to the side primarily because of these kinds of economic factors that dominate. Well, I don't know. I, just, I, I see these as different for us. So like with international scientific cooperation, there, there's, that's again, a, you know, shot through with serious economic implications for, you know, information era innovation economies, right? and the creative sector generally. Um, but I was less interested in the implications of what's at issue, economically speaking, and more about the specific ways, often very specific ways, that frames of commonality are built through these kinds of interactions, right? Regardless of perverse economic incentives that might keep people at odds. Right? So science, and here very, very generally talking, right, very vaguely about science and, 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 and not wanting to suggest some kind of unproblematic notion of science as a kind of discourse and practice, is one of those spaces because it's a place where people tend to want to bring highly technical talk that they share in common together to solve specific problems that most other people don't understand. Right, like the nanotech thing, I get it. There's these micro, you know, minuscule things that might cause that are, you know, buzzing around in the atmosphere of which I might or might not be aware. But I'll leave it to the science geeks to have some kind of meaningful discussion about this and then come up with something useful in the area of regulating its, you know, uh, the intellectual property of nanotech, the, you know, uh, regulatory oversight of, you know, problematic, you know, innovation experimentation or whatever. Um, and that happens because it's focused on the subject at hand rather than whether or not there is an economy or a set of economic priorities that would push things in another direction. Right, so I'm not actually saying that, yeah, this is some kind of answer to the problem of the ways that the bottom line is always going to cause things to happen differently. These are all very modest piecemeal examples of a type. <laughs> 
And I'm suggesting that there's like many more of these as well, right? But it's a matter of sort of scale of, of engagement. Sure, go ahead. I want to ask you in a more open-ended way. Um, you know, you've talked about culture in, in the ways that we are kind of accustomed to, and it's most visible arts, entertainment, maybe certain commercial products that are largely food and beverage. Um, but what are areas that interest you personally um, outside of that that might have implicit in them some sort of cultural embedding, such as health or you know, beliefs in health, um, legalistic uh, jurisprudence kinds of questions that you see as active right. sites where this kind of... Well, there's a lot of different things. And what I want to be clear about there is you're right that a lot of the specific things we, we discussed just today are in many ways quite recognizable to us, conventionally speaking. My point about that was not just to really beat this horse absolutely, completely, to the point where maybe even the dental records aren't sufficient. <laughs> um, it's not, my point about that is not to remind us of those familiar constructions so much as to um, suggest the kind of work they do in a specifically policy space of, of priority setting, right? That, that creates problems for us in a number of ways. But moving on from there, um, uh, and Betty and I were just talking about that before the talk. I, I think I, one of the things that I've been doing a lot of work around these days is um, different, um, unexpected, and because interesting interventions, uh, intersections between culture and new kinds of technology platforms. And so the interest, not just in the digital humanities as a kind of a far end of a continuum that is kind of groping toward a rapprochement with, you know, more hard hat type sciencey activities. Right, which is kind of part of what that game is all about. You know, we here in the university need to justify broadly the liberal arts in some way. One good way is to kind of make the case that the digital humanities are like science. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, cynically that that's certainly at work. But uh, more generally, how uh, sociocultural knowledge is leveraged into these kinds of things, and I'm specifically interested in new kinds of computational tools for kind of cultural predictive sciences, which is crazy town and some other things having to do with the interest in accessing previously unaccessible cultural data uh, through um, Google-type apps that allow us to draw conclusions about that data, but which in so doing carries with it right, a kind of set of ideas about what data is. Data is apparently just variables we can count, so <coughs> we should alarm us all. But. Uh, so that would be one area that I've been speaking, thinking a lot about. Like, you know. We're going to have to call it quits because we've got a class coming in, but thank, thank, thank for our guests.